<laughs> well, Samara, thank you so much for joining us on the Music Business Dreams podcast. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Um, now, for those who may not be familiar with you or your work, why don't you give us a, a quick introduction? Okay. Um, my name is Samara Jacques. I'm an entertainment attorney here in Miami. Um, my focus in my firm is on entertainment law and business law, um, but most of the business law that I practice is involves somehow entertainment or fashion industry. And I've had my firm, my own firm, for the last three years. Nice, nice. So what got you into law? I mean, I don't, well, yeah, we'll, we'll just, I'll just, I'll leave it open. What got you into law? Uh, I am the daughter of Caribbean parents. So it was either lawyer or doctor, and I'm not a big fan of blood. It scares me. Um, but actually, Johnny Cochran, um, yeah. this gives women age, I'm 35. Um, but Johnny Cochran, I saw him during the O.J. Simpson trial, and he was the first Black attorney that I've ever seen. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to do what he's doing. So in fourth grade, I was like, that's it. I'm doing it. And then I just ended up going to law school. Law school isn't like what you think it is, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I didn't really like it that much. Um, but then I practiced and uh, I sort of found my own niche later on um, in commercial litigation. And I realized I've always loved entertainment. I've always loved music. So I was like, you know what, what's the worst that can happen? So I just quit one day my other job and I started my own firm. And uh, that's what got me into law was Johnny Cochran. Gotcha. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I figured... It's it's a terrible assumption to make, but when you see black lawyers, a lot of it is, you know, immigrant parents, and they were really like, all right, doctor, lawyer, government job, like those yeah. are your options. Yeah, security. I mean, right. I, I get it, and I'm not mad at them for it. Um, I just had I got lucky. Now I'm practicing something I actually love doing. So, got you. Um, where are your where is your family from? Uh, my parents are Haitian. Uh, they're both from Haiti. Uh, my sister and I actually were born in the same year. So I was born in January of 85, and my sister was born in December of 85. Um, and then about two years after that, my parents, because of some conflicts that were happening in Haiti, they moved us to the U.S., um, but we ended up in Oklahoma. So I think we were the only Haitians that may have been there at that time. <laughs> Got you. Yeah. That's cool. My, uh, my grandfather is from the Virgin Islands, but it's very similar. He was a carpenter yeah. and found his way to New York, met my grandmother, and a couple generations later, I'm here. So, um, so, so you got into law and you went through the very boring route and found yourself in entertainment, is, is what I'm hearing. Um, uh, actually, entertainment found me. Um, okay. To be fair, uh, in college, I did think I wanted to go to New York and be an A and R, um, but I'm painfully shy, so that was a little bit difficult because A and R involves a lot of like schmoozing with people. Um, so I just ended up you know, doing college, going to law school, and then uh, working for a couple of firms. Uh, I've done everything, insurance, uh, I've done med mal, I've done product liability, all of it. Um, but I've always, always, always loved entertainment. I'm kind of obsessed with media. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in the background. Um, around a year ago, I had worked for the court system um, for Miami-Dade, and I just, I couldn't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I just figured, I was like, let me just work on my own. I was taking what they like to call door law, which everything that walks into the door you take. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, um, rental disputes, things like that. Um, and then I got my first client who was an entertainment client who was actually a vegan rapper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, shout out to Josh, Born Legacy. Um, and from there, I just got more clients that were in the entertainment industry. And um, then I got another client uh, who was in Hamilton, actually. Nice. Which is really cool because I'm obsessed with him. <laughs> um, and um, it just kind of worked its way from there. And since I've always loved entertainment, I was like, why not I just go this route? I didn't know you could do that in Florida, but it really doesn't matter where you're located because it's all transactional work. It's all contracts. So mm -hmm. um, that's what I mean. It just found me. I got lucky enough that people sort of gravitated towards me, even though I wasn't too established in it yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a lot of contract work and that, you know, it relates. So it worked out pretty well. Got you. So I'm going to have a couple of friends who are lawyers. I'm not well versed in that area of life. Yeah. Right. But um, I guess my question is like, I know you go to law school. There's a whole big to do about passing the bar mm -hmm. and then you can kind of go get a job, do whatever. Right. When you decide you want to work in entertainment, there's not like an entertainment bar 
So how do you familiarize yourself with those aspects of it? Mostly it's just trial and error and practice. Um, you, the more contracts you see, the better you get at it because you have to know what everyone's doing at that certain time. Um, there are things that are just standard industry practice for every industry. Mm -hmm. um, but there are books too. Um, obviously, people are going to tell you about Donald Passon's book, you know, everything you know about music business, or um, Ari Herstand, who was on your show, mm -hmm. his book. Um, there's CLEs on that. Uh, there's a Black Entertainment Lawyers Association, which I will be joining this year finally. <laughs> Um, you know, there are ways to sort of learn what you need to learn. Um, the information's out there. It's just, it's really just getting the practice. And lucky for me, I've been able to get clients that have let me do the practice. Um, you know who Coffee is? Are you familiar with her? The reggae artist? That sounds familiar. She had a song called Toast. It was like everywhere last year. Last and year I listened to nothing, but. <laughs> how? how? You were the music guy. <laughs> you know, I think being in the music industry was the worst thing to happen to my music hobby. Oh, no. Right. It's like you're you're it, when I'm listening, I'm listening critically. Yeah. Because, you know, true. I started out in production. Um, but then also it's just like people are always like, oh, listen to my music, listen to my music. And I'm like, no, I don't want to listen to your music. Right. So I <laughs> I've got like my four or five artists that I'll listen to whoever, whatever they put out. Yeah. Like, you know, Kendrick, J. Cole, uh, Rhapsody. And then I'll, I guess I'll leave the other two spots open, right? Okay. But um, yeah, so I'll listen to, you know, stuff that I'm already familiar with. Or if my friend's like, oh, you got to listen to this, I'll check it out or whatever. But I don't listen to the radio um, because I spend so much of my time podcasting, uh, making YouTube videos, things like that. I'm almost always doing some form of research. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos, reading, I spend a lot of time reading. Um, mm -hmm. and when I'm doing any of those things, it's like, I can't listen to music because if I'm listening to music. I'm only focused on the music. But um, I even like instrumentals, like classical music or jazz, like right. while you're reading, that doesn't so help at all. I'll play like lo-fi study beats. Okay. Right. Okay. And so I couldn't tell you who any of the artists on these playlists are, but I can hear like two bars of their beat. And I'm like, oh, I know that one. Okay. That's, you know, so that's that's what that's what music's been like as a hobby for me recently. I've been okay. trying to step back and like try to enjoy it again, especially since quarantine started. Mm -hmm. Um so like uh Apple Music did the Black Music Day on the Blackout Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And so they had like a DJ on the Beats One radio. And that was really fun, like hearing stuff that I hadn't heard in a while, hearing new things that I had never mm -hmm. heard of. Like it was cool, so but yeah, I don't know how we took that detour. I don't remember what I was going to ask you. I think I'm asking the questions now. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead. So, um, okay. So you find yourself in entertainment or entertainment finds you. Um, I was asking how you got uh, v familiar with entertainment law, but you're like, it's, you know, it's kind of trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, so how was it finding clients? I know you said you've you got a couple that's kind of, I don't know, fell into your lap or took a chance on you, but navigating that space for someone who may be, who may aspire to be an entertainment attorney, I want to make sure that um, I'm kind of leaving a, a trail for them to follow. I got you. Um, referrals and sliding into DMs, actually. That mm. is probably the best way to do things. I know that's probably not what people have told you to do, um, <laughs> but it worked out well for me, especially um, uh, you had Stephanie Hay on mm -hmm. your podcast before. Mm -hmm. um, I actually just messaged her randomly because I was following her. Mm -hmm. um, and I really liked what she was doing. And she's another Black female attorney. There aren't a lot of us. So I, I basically have done that with Amy O said so, um, Zara Watson Law, like a bunch of them. So mm -hmm. just people who aren't necessarily in my geographical area, that was mm -hmm. helpful. Um, and then as far as finding clients, it was just a lot of like going to shows. Like mm -hmm. literally going to shows, talking to people. Um, again, I told you I'm painfully shy. So mm -hmm. it was really hard for me to like get out there and be like, hello, my name's Samara, I'm an entertainment attorney. But that was the best way to do it, actually, mm -hmm. was just talking to people, seeing what they did. If I liked their music, I would, you know, ask them about what they were doing, you know, how they're setting everything up, if they're having any trouble, like contact me. Mm -hmm. And then that's how Latte Lawyer was started because I met them at coffee shops. People don't like going into the law office. I think they prefer to go to the dentist's office, actually, than go to the law office. <laughs> wow. So, 
I mean, they, they really don't like it. And I understand that because, I mean, if you look at a contract or if you look at an attorney, they're always telling you you're doing something wrong. Mm. So I figured if I could put them in a space where they're comfortable, which is a coffee shop, and we can just have a conversation, it was a lot easier to, you know, see what the client needed. So that way I can actually help them get what they, where they needed to go with their legal issue. Okay. So tell me how it is being an entertainment attorney not based in New York. I know, um, like you mentioned Passman's book, right? And a lot of what Passman talks about is how your attorney is really, you're, you're using them for their Rolodex. They may be able to help pitch your music to a label, so yeah. on and so forth. I imagine it's different for you not being in the tri-state area. Um, that doesn't actually apply. A lot of lawyers don't always pitch their clients. Mm. Um, I would tell you that usually the manager, if you have a good one, they're handling that. Um, and the attorney is just making sure that the contract is as fair as possible as it can be to you. Mm -hmm. um, and just to make sure that you know what you're signing. That's pretty much it. That's my experience. I'm not going to speak about the OG. It's on the past. And I got that, you know, like everyone's <laughs> different. Right. Um, but also like, you know, you have connections. I've referred people to, you know, certain other people, but um, it doesn't really apply to me because I mm -hmm. mostly work with helping them establish what they need to collect and uh, what they need to make sure they understand about a contract when they sign. And um, it's very, very little about pitching. Okay. Um, now, now it's a little different because of quarantine. So um, I've been working on like, like a low key project with a couple of clients about um, placements because we've had some issues with like sampling and keeping mm -hmm. their work, um, making it able to monetize. Right. So I'm work. I work with them on that, like the pitching part of it when it comes to um, sync, but not like, you know, industry contacts. Got you. OK, so um, getting back into like the day, a day in the life. Right. So you, you've taken these clients out of the law office. You're, you're going into spaces where they're comfortable. What types of things are you seeing that artists need the most or are most interested in when they meet with you? Uh, I think there's just a misunderstanding of what you need to start. I mm -hmm. <laughs> Clients don't understand or artists don't understand that art is a business, unfortunately, if you want to collect. If you're just, you know, making it in your music in your home to enjoy, no problem. But if you're mm -hmm. making it because you want to be able to collect royalties, you have to set up, you know, certain things. Like you have to sign up with your PRO, which most people know, so that's never a problem. But mm -hmm. I know that that was mentioned in your talk, Sound Exchange. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know about that. Um, Harry Fox Agency or music reports, you know, mm -hmm. to sign up for those things. Um, collecting on YouTube. Like there's a lot of paperwork that's involved with making sure that every single stream that you have is going to be collected back to you. Right. And then also establishing a business, like whether you're going to be a sole proprietor or if you're going to have an LLC. This doesn't apply right now because of quarantine, but if you're going to be touring, there's liability issues. Mm -hmm. So some I tell people a lot of the times, like make sure that if you have a trademark for your name, have a separate LLC for that as a holding company so that doesn't get compromised and then have a separate company if possible for your touring. And if something happens and they can only go after the touring company right. and they're not going after your trademarks and basically you could lose that because if there's a lawsuit, then that's a huge issue and they're going to collect whatever they can from the company. Mm -hmm. Wow. So a lot of sounds like what you're doing is um, preventive measures, right? Mm -hmm. Just look, you're, you're going into a field where there are a lot of sharks. You know, I can try to help be a guide, but then also let me let you know, you need a life jacket and here's the life jacket. I would say it's more like learning how to swim. Like, I think the problem is, is I, and I hate to say like, I guess it's the diplomatic answer where you're like, yeah, there are a lot of sharks, especially in the music industry. You have to be careful. You have to vet people. It's mm -hmm. surprising to me. Sometimes people are like, they'll sign a lot of things for a person they don't even know. They don't mm -hmm. have a social security number. They don't have their EIN number. They don't have anything. They don't know anything about this person. Sometimes mm -hmm. it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I think the problem is, is that if you don't know the mechanics of how to get through things, because there are steps in the processes, like, you know, this, because you, you know, you have whole courses on it. Like mm -hmm. Once you know how to walk through the steps or, you know, to learn how to swim, like to the end of the pool and mm -hmm. you can swim back, like you understand how that works. So a lot of my business is just helping people walk through what they need to treat their music 
like a business. So that yeah. way they're able to actually take their creative work and live off of it, hopefully. And if not live off of it, at least make, you know, a decent income off of what they're doing. Got you. So while we're on that subject, what do you feel like the most common mistakes that you see artists make? Um, only having a split sheet, but not um, doing anything with the sound recording is a huge problem. Um, mm. Thinking that sampling isn't a big issue, um, which either it's going to be an issue with a takedown, which can be a problem, or you have a, like, I've heard so many great songs that I've wanted to like, be like, okay, you should pitch this to Terror Bird or another placement agency but they can't pitch it because they haven't cleared the sample. Mm. So they're cutting themselves off of a placement that could have gotten them $5,000, $8,000, $20,000 mm. and just because they wanted to sample a song. So I think those are the two big issues, the sampling. Um, and I would say also um, just not putting their paperwork in order and understanding the implications of that. Okay. So, um, yeah, I know like right now, and it's been like this for a little while, right? But I've seen a lot of music producers, especially like just straight up beat makers online, right? Who mm -hmm. they may put a few songs on beat stars, they might get started. And then it's like, oh, the new thing is like collaboration, right? Yeah. Like I'll, I'll put up the drums, you put the melody down, you put down some keys, and then we're going to all together pitch it to XYZ artist who then puts it on their mixtape or whatever a week from now, right? Just, can you break down just from that example, what steps should be taken um, for an artist to kind of do that the right way? Is this with a sample or without a sample? Let's just make it easy and say without. <laughs> okay, if it's without a sample, all they really need is a split sheet. Uh, you can get, uh, BMI has them, ASCAP has them, your PRO probably has a sample split sheet. Um, and then you make sure I would like to do this before you even get into the studio if possible, mm. or if you're not in the studio together because of quarantine or you happen to be like, I know a lot of beat makers, sometimes they're collaborating with people, you know, mm. in Europe or, you know, in Africa, that's a, there's a lot of people working with African mm. artists nowadays. Um, I've been lucky to work with some of them, cool. um, you know, just doing e-signature mm. and making sure that everyone puts their PRO, um, their IPI number. Uh, their address, their email address, like all that information that they need mm -hmm. um, to have a publisher on the other side. See, it's never like super easy. So like with BMI, you as a writer can collect both the publisher side and the writer side because it's 200%, like you right. know. But with ASCAP, you can't collect your publisher side. It has to be 50% writer, 50% publisher. Mm -hmm. So if you're ASCAP, then you have to make sure that you have a vanity publisher and have that set up too. So just basically make sure that all the paperwork is done on both sides and then go through it, um, put what they've contributed. So if it's only instrumentals, like you're working with two producers, then you would put that they're both composers. Mm -hmm. That's important because a producer technically isn't a composer. Right. Um, producers like can just put things together, but they may not even actually compose anything on mm -hmm. the record. So you want to make sure you, you know, identify that, have everyone sign off. And um, also maybe put like a little terms and conditions on the bottom saying that if you're gonna pitch it, that either one of you can sign off for the other person. So right. that way, if you do wanna pitch to a sync agency or you wanna pitch to a music supervisor or you wanna pitch to a trailer house, um, you're able to go ahead and do that quickly because I've seen a lot of deals fall through because people don't check their emails as mm -hmm. effectively as maybe other people do um, right. and they lose an opportunity. So right. I would say, that's as simple as I can make it. <laughs> okay. that that's what you would need to do okay. um, to make sure that it's all done on the, the publishing side. Okay. And then for the sound recording, mm -hmm. you have a separate documentation that says that you both either split it or it's a work for hire, um, but you just need to have ownership of that other side, which is the sound recording side. Got you. This. Got you. Okay. So um, for anyone listening or watching, um, I do have a split sheet template that you can download at kdmr.us slash split sheet. So I will leave the link in the show notes and in the description of this video. Um, so that's one last step you've got to take. All right, so we've talked about a relatively simple example. And I know just listening to everything that you just mentioned, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot that we kind of glossed over. And I don't want to say glossed over, but- No, we glossed over, yeah. Right. It's, <laughs> My point is, this is a very complex 
thing, right? And, you know, we try to make it as simple as possible, you know, for an understanding standpoint. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you, you've touched on, uh, clearing houses. You, you touched on, um, why sound libraries, you touched on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And then we also didn't talk about what happens when, okay, for example, Lil Wayne says, oh, I like this beat. Now I want to record this. And now, okay, well, how does that work? If you've got the copyright to the beat, but then he decides to make a song with it. Is there a new copyright created? Technically, yes, but it also hasn't been cleared. Mm. So he's actually violated your copyright. So at that point, you have to make a decision about what you want to do as an artist, whether it's worth it for the promo to have him, you know, spit over your verse, not verse, I'm sorry, spit over your beat mm -hmm. and, you know, potentially make it a really big thing. Uh, or if you need to contact, you know, his label or even his lawyer and be like, it needs to be taken down or you have to do a DMCA takedown notice. So that's, that's where the business side comes in. You have to decide, even though that it's, it's a clear violation. If he hasn't come to you and said, can I use your beat? Then he's violating your copyright. But from there, you have to decide where you're going to move forward. And if you haven't registered your copyright, you can't actually do anything with it. Like you can't file a lawsuit until it's registered with the um, copyright office and mm -hmm. cleared through the copyright office. Before just the registration was enough, the process, but then after um, the Supreme Court, like the, the decision, um, you have to wait until it's actually processed before you can file your lawsuit. So that's another step and that takes a long time. How long would you say? It's the US government. So <laughs> I mean, I hate to be that person, but uh, it could be six months. It could mm -hmm. be a year. Um, sometimes I've seen people whose uh, copyright registrations have gotten lost. Mm -hmm. um, so they had to get that fixed. So it, it really just depends on how lucky you are and where you are in the queue. Wow. Okay. So and I had my next question queued up and then I didn't. So <laughs> let's, um, all right. So let's get off of the little Wayne example, right? Now, you did say something important. I want to make sure that um, people understand what you're saying, right? So if Lil Wayne decides to record on your beat, he has violated your copyright, right? Like if he just, hasn't cleared it with you. Yeah. If he has not cleared it with you. Um, and so I think a lot of times, and just that there's power in the language, right? And a lot of times we think that because someone has more followers than us, is more popular, um, has more money whatever that they call the shots, right? Can you explain um, how much power an artist has like as a creative, if they just know how to use it the right way? Yeah, um, I love the fact that intellectual property um, allows you to share like, um, so, cause there's real property, right? That's like a house or, you know, apartment building. Mm -hmm. Intellectual property is, is very similar to a house and in, in that it's yours and you can do what you want with it um and it has the potential to make you more money than having a house or an apartment building right mm -hmm. so with that being said since you are the owner of this you know uh, intellectual property you can do a lot with it now as soon as you you know write down your song onto uh paper or you record it as long as it's you know fixed mm -hmm. and it's original it's now your copyright. The registration is a second part of it. So that way, if something happens, like Lil Wayne decides that he wants to use your beat. Sorry, I'm using Lil Wayne as an example. I didn't say you were Lil Wayne, don't come after me. Um, but if he decides to use your beat and he hasn't cleared it with you, now you have another step to go ahead and file a lawsuit against Lil Wayne. Mm -hmm. And from there, you can get either real damages, you know, actual damages, or you can get statutory damages. Mm -hmm. And statutory damages, um, if it's malicious, um, can be up to $150,000 per violation. Mm -hmm. And also that in, can include your attorney's fees and costs. So right. that means that Lil Wayne will have to pay for all of that. So a song that maybe costs you, let's say, with your equipment in your room, maybe cost you that $1,000 to make all together, mm -hmm. you could get potentially $300,000 plus your attorney's fees. Right. You know, to go ahead and take care of that. And a lot of attorneys are willing to kind of work 
uh, either on a contingency fee basis, um, knowing that they'll be able to collect later um, mm -hmm. for that reason. So yeah, you do have a lot of power. You just have to know what happens when your copyright gets violated, which is sort of where the attorney walks in and it's like, okay, here are your options. Right. And, you know, I do want to just reiterate, like you are not powerless in those situations. One thing about sampling law, intellectual property law, record companies are super afraid to set precedents when it comes to sampling. So they will do anything they can to settle it out of court, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone except the Marvin Gaye estate seems to not want to take these things to court. Yeah, that's very true. So, um, you know, you've got the upper hand, especially now we're in the age of the internet. So it's a little bit easier to prove that you owned something mm -hmm. before. Um, again, as long as you registered it the right way. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't feel like you have to take whatever you can get, but I'm sure you'll hire an attorney and they'll help you through that process. I'm going to say something that a lot of attorneys are probably going to get mad at me for. Um, you may not need to hire an attorney for your first step. You can mm -hmm. usually just write a letter. Um, I like to call them my vaguely threatening letters saying that mm -hmm. we'll seek all available options, which means basically that you're going to sue. Mm -hmm. um, and usually when you send that kind of letter, that's enough for their attorneys or for the artists themselves to come to you and be like, okay, I messed up. What can we do to fix this? So mm -hmm. I don't have to go to court. So right. that usually a letter, the power of words is enough to get you to the next step without having to go to an attorney and pay the fees that you would normally have to pay. Got you. Okay. So we've talked about some of the artists that, or some of the mistakes that artists make. Um, what we haven't talked I don't about. Any mistakes. I just want to be clear because okay. you don't know. I think that, you know, it's a learning process. Mm. So I think it maybe is just, um, I don't want to use the word mistake. I'm not going to use it. I can't think of another word, but it's not a mistake. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've talked about um, I got some places that artists can go if they are not well-versed, right? Yes. Things. Things they may do um, not knowing any better, right? Um, but I want to talk, I want to speak to being an entertainment attorney or, you know, whether you're relatively new or you've been doing it for a while, what are some things about the way things work that you feel need to change um, from an attorney standpoint? I don't want to get in trouble. I feel like if I say this, it's going to be an issue. Oh. Okay, I'll say it. I'll say it this way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are some things that you would like to bring to your clients? Things that you, or what are some ways that you want to do or to operate your business um, that you feel like maybe aren't happening now? Uh, I would like um, if there are work for hires, more revenue shares. So you can still own the actual song, but you can give more points to the artists. Mm -hmm. So think of it like if you own a house, um, you can still give somebody a portion of the rent. They're not going to own the house, but they'll still get the money from it. Okay. Um, so I would like to see more of that. I definitely would like to see more. I'm not saying anyone specifically or any label specifically. Um, you know, some quicker turnaround times with payment, especially to producers. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it can take a wildly long time to get paid on a record. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like for a lot of people to actually do the paperwork prior to actually, you know, um, releasing the song. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Instead of afterwards, cause that happens sometimes a year later you get that. Mm -hmm. So I just would like the process to be a little bit more, um, to be more forward thinking than to like work on hindsight a lot of the time. So a lot of these processes are complicated, they're overly complicated for no reason. If you had okay. just done it beforehand, we wouldn't have to do all of this back and forth. Okay. Got you. So, and you know, while we're on the subject, let's shed some light. How long would you say, I don't even want to say on average, what's the longest you've seen it take for a producer to get paid from a major label? You don't okay. have to name specifics. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just trying to think. I'm trying to think. Um, <laughs> I've had six months personally, but I've mm. heard from people, and mm. I can't substantiate that, like two years. So it, it honestly depends on the label, and it depends on this, uh, also on the leverage of the producer, which mm. kind of sucks, but it's just true. So if a producer has uh, a little more weight behind him or her, they tend to get paid a lot quicker. Mm. 
Yeah, there's a, there's a lot that goes into that. I've heard from and it, a lot of like you said, is a lot of time it's it's the new producer who may have just gotten his first placement on you know a major album, and it's like okay, cool, I'm set, right? Call my mom, she can quit her job tomorrow, and then it's like oh, uh, yeah. so, but. And maybe you can shed some light as to, you know, why it may take so long, or at least what the reasons people are listing for it taking long. I mean, um, major and independent labels, um, mm-hmm. they tend to be bigger entities. So when you have more layers to go through, it takes a lot longer to pay. Mm-hmm. Um, they usually do it in batches too. So you're going to be sent to accounting with maybe 50, 60, 100 other people, mm-hmm. and they have to issue those checks. So that's another reason that it could take a, a while to get paid. Um, and again, if you are a new producer or if you're one that, you know, isn't bringing in huge numbers, um, you're not going to also have anyone to advocate for you necessarily at the label to be mm-hmm. like, we don't want to piss this person off, like make sure to pay them because we want to be able to have them do the next record with us. We don't want a problem. Okay. So something you mentioned earlier um, was that you know, in the case that someone violates your copyright, you may not need to straight away hire a lawyer, right? But then when we talk about building a team around an artist, one of the first people that's recommended is a lawyer. Um, how early do you feel a lawyer is needed, um, whether you're putting someone on retainer or just putting feelers out? Or... I, I hate this question because it's, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, mm. Every time I'm asked, I'm just like, I... It depends on the artist. It depends on the team. Um, I would say as soon as you have a, a, well, as soon as you're planning on releasing your music, just consult with an attorney about getting all of your stuff together. I like to call it getting your sheet together, like your split sheet, like Uh make sure to have your publishing together, make sure to have your registrations, all that stuff done. So that would be the first time that I think that you should step in with an attorney if you don't already have a manager. Okay. And then I would say the next time that you should speak with an attorney is when you have a contract in front of you, especially if you're signing with a manager, because a manager is going to be with you for a very long time Mm -hmm. and they're going to take a very large percentage of whatever you're making. Do you think regular labels are taking a lot from you and managers, good managers are worth it. Every penny. Like I would pay them extra and tip them if they are a good manager. Mm -hmm. But if you have a bad manager, and they're taking, you know, I've seen management contracts where they want to take 50% of what the artist is making, which Jeez. is not industry standard. Exactly. It's not industry standard to take 50%. Right. And that manager specifically was also asking to get paid monthly. Wow. That's not normal. You shouldn't be doing that. If a manager right. asks for you to pay them, run away. Right. That shouldn't happen. So that's what I would say. Like, as soon as you have a contract, come to an attorney um, and then if you need to like establish your the business side of music, come to an attorney. Okay. So those are like basically the touchstones of when you need to speak with an attorney. Got you. Wow, 50%. 50% plus payment. I was like, this is a joke. When I got the email, I was like, this isn't a real thing. Cause I thought maybe it was like, maybe this like late April Fool's thing. I was like, ha very funny. No, it was, it was real serious. Wow. Yeah. So, um, well, that's crazy. I know that when I got started studying the industry, this was, I was in school 2010. And at that time, industry standard was 10 to 15%. Mm-hmm. I've seen in some textbooks now, they're saying it goes from 10 all the way up to 25%, which mm-hmm. is crazy. Um, but yeah, 50%, that's, that's insane. Yeah, it is. Because a lot of times that management figure is based off your gross totals, not your net. Okay. And there's a difference in that too, which I've also, I'm glad you brought that up. Mm. Gross is what you're just all paid, right? Like the amount that you're paid. Net is what is deducted. So if you are actually, like what you're actually taking home, which Mm -hmm. is important. So I would always try to advocate for an artist to ask for net revenue if possible. Right. Because sometimes you're paying over what you actually don't have. So like yeah. for touring, you may get, let's let's say you have a tour and you made a small tour, you made fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> but net you only brought back thirty, right? Because right. you had to pay for life, you had to pay for, you know, your stay, room board, like food, all that stuff, costumes, makeup, hair, all of it. Mm-hmm. Your your sound guy, 
right? There's so much, there's so much involved. And then your insurance on top of that. And so then not to mention your booking agent, who's also getting a percentage. Yeah, everyone's getting something from you. And then when you get the money, then you have to pay your manager 15 to 20 percent of you know the 50,000 that you don't have. So that's an additional 20,000 you have to add on top and you have to figure out how to get that to them. So if possible, always try to go with a net deal and not a gross deal. Your manager is not going to like it, but it's the fairest way I think to kind of handle things. You shouldn't really, I mean, it depends, but most of the time I would say net is the best way to go. Absolutely. Um, now there are some schools of thought that will say it's better to just hire someone to perform management like duties and pay mm -hmm. them a salary. How common do you feel that is? And does, do you think that really makes sense? Um, actually, yeah, it does. It, but it also depends on like how far along you are. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're treating your music like a business, um, paying somebody salary, you know, exactly what your fixed costs are going to be by the end of the year. Um, well, you're able to go ahead and expense that. So you may be able to get, if not all, some of it back, you know, when you have a good accountant. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you treat that person as either an employee or independent contractor that you pay, then in some cases that's better, but for like the beginning artist, that's really mm -hmm. hard to swing because you're not making that kind of steady income usually when right. you're starting. So I would say that was more for like a mid-level touring artist or like Beyonce, you know, like somebody <laughs> who's already like an entity in and of themselves already. Right, right. Okay. So I feel like I can't go the whole interview without asking about the so-called poor man's copyright. <sighs> okay, go ahead. Oh, no, that was it. So... <laughs> Why don't you tell our audience about the so-called poor man's copyright and give us your thoughts on it? Uh, there are different variations of okay. it, um, but the old school one that I know of is mailing um, basically a letter to yourself saying that you are the copyright owner of such and such track or track or album. Mm -hmm. um, and then keeping that as your copyright, that that's proof that you've actually registered copyright. It mm -hmm. is not. Um, I've heard people saying send emails to the USPTO. Um, they're not going to read those. So I just, I want to put a, let you know that as well. Um, mm. Because the USPTO actually is for the Patent and Trademark Office. They have nothing to do with copyright. So right. that, you're sending it to the wrong department, first and foremost. Mm. Um, so the poor man's copyright's not a thing. You have a copyright as soon as you create the work. If I started, which I would never do to anyone, but if I started singing right now, Mm -hmm. I would have created an original work, right? That mm -hmm. is, you know, fixed on this video. And right. therefore I have a copyright right now. Mm -hmm. You have a copyright. Now there's a difference between registering the copyright, which I'd have to actually go and do it as a film, mm -hmm. right? Maybe a motion picture that you'd have to register um, with the copyright office, mm -hmm. but there's no such thing as a poor man's copyright. So, I mean, people, please, I don't know who started it. I don't know why, but it's not a thing. Don't do it. Save your money. Just, just go register it. It's super easy to do at the copyright office and you can do unpublished works too, up to 10. And it, it saves you a lot of money if you want to do it that way. Okay. So let's say I, I, again, I'm a beat maker, right? So I'll make a beat. There's no samples, just a cool piano melody, some kick drums, whatever. Right. Okay. And I name my beat as producers often do, I don't know, Sunshine 347. Okay. Right. So if I register Sunshine 347 and then let's say someone comes to me, let's say J. Cole for this example, says, Hey, I heard this song on a beat tape. I really like it. You know, can I record a verse to it? How what what goes what happens from there? How does my copyright affect it? Because obviously he's not gonna call it Sunshine 347. Oh, he's going to incorporate the beat and create a new work. I mean, that's what mm. they do with reggae songs all the time. But he still has to put you on the publishing side. So like mm. on the split sheet um, as, you know, a composer because you created the beat. And then if he wants to, um, you know, if his label wants to go ahead and do that with you, Dreamville, they can go ahead and give you either, which they're probably not going to do. Labels never do this. 
Mm-hmm. Um, well, not never, but more, 99% don't. Um, they're going to keep the sound recording, but they may give you points. Um, it used to be that when you started, it'd be like, you know, they, they used to be nice and give you three points, like mm-hmm. even for a newer producer. Now um, we're talking about like one point if you're lucky. Um, and, and what uh, is a point? Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> a point is a percentage of the record. So with publishing, you get your percentages from your split sheets, uh, which is fine, but that's just for the melody and the lyrics. So that's the actual written song. Okay. But for the sound recording, the actual like thing that you're hearing on Spotify, the track itself, mm-hmm. it's a separate copyright and right. it involves separate money that you can get. So okay. that's what sound exchange is for. It's for okay. the digital performance. Okay. So with that, um, normally you're going to have like a work, they'll either do it, they're going to do it as a work for hire. So the, the label's going to own it, but okay. then they'll give you, like we talked about with rent. So they're going to own the house, the song, mm-hmm. but they'll give you a percentage of the rent, what they make. Okay. So one point is 1%, five points is 5%, um, so on and so forth. Um, usually bigger, um, bigger producers are going to get higher points. So okay. you're talking about like, you know, one to three and then three to five and then five up. Okay. Um, if you're a producer who's been in the game for a really long time, then usually you're going to have um, a different deal where you're actually bringing in artists and you're actually getting a share of either the revenue or like a percentage or you're getting stock with the label, however they want to go ahead and do that with you. But since it's proprietary and it's quiet, they're not going to share that with the me or anybody else, but okay. they have ways of structuring those deals. Okay. So nerd talk. So when you create a work, right? That's what we, that's what we call music or whatever mm-hmm. works for the copyright office. Yes. And you register that you, you have your copyright. And I used to have this memorized, but having a copyright gives you well, it's, it's more than one right. It's not just the copyright kind of refers to a series of rights. And mm-hmm. obviously you can speak more to this than I can. Right. But one of the abilities you get is the right to create a derivative work. Yes. Right. My favorite. Yes. Okay. And so, and that's what we're talking about in the sense, in the case of J Cole or whoever finds my beat, wants to record a song. So now that what they make is a derivative work. Is that how that works or? Um, <laughs> it's not necessarily a derivative work. A derivative okay. work would be like if I had, if um, let's say I happen to really love Dreamville's Down Bad. You know that okay. song? Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So if I decided I wanted to make a musical mm. off of that song, mm. that's a derivative work. If I ah. wanted to make a TV show based off of an album that's a derivative work um if you are taking a beat from somebody else and incorporating it into another song that's either a sample right okay. and then that needs to be cleared so it's not really a derivative in the sense that like what is contemplated by the copyright law ah uh-huh. yeah. see we're all here to learn <laughs> all right i told you derivatives are my favorite so i'm gotcha. glad you asked that question why are they your favorite it just shows you like just being inspired by other art is just um i mean so let me back up my prediction is that a lot of the things that we see now um like the digital millennium copyright act passing mm-hmm. um it's going to be a lot easier for artists to access other works it's very cost prohibitive to sample i think that's unfair because there's a lot of work that's really great that comes from sampling so i think you should pay an artist but i don't think that if you're a new artist and it's not going to make you huge money like right now, mm-hmm. you should have to pay $1,000, 2500 plus 50% of the song on the publishing side in order to go ahead and use it. Okay. Um, so the reason that I personally really love um, derivative work is because you're inspired by somebody else's art to create your own art. So it's just mm-hmm. like this session and like sharing and collaboration that makes art so beautiful and so wonderful. And that's why I'm a big fan of derivative works because okay. it just shows you that you're it's it's paying homage to the person you're inspired by and creating something completely new out of it. Got you. And is the process for clearing that and how similar is it to sampling? Um, it it's not usually. Mm. <laughs> um, usually there's more rights. Like if it's gonna be a film, there's gonna be a lot more paperwork involved. Okay. Um, 
but uh, it depends on how close it is. If it's just like, I don't know, you're taking um, somebody's lyrics and you're creating a book of poetry based off of those lyrics, then, um, you know, you're, you're, it's a little bit closer to, I would say, publishing, but like, oh, but a different type. So, okay. not bad for Okay. So I'm going to ask a question kind of out of the blue, but you've, you, you've stopped on it. So I am wearing a shirt. This is um, an artist that I consult with. His name is Pat Jr. One of his lyrics on his last single is called Rest. And I'm, this is all shameless plugging, right? So uh, the song is called Rest. And one of the lyrics says, good mental health is a flex, right? And so he made this shirt. It's got a skull with a flexing brain on it. It's cool. Right. Um, but it says good mental health is a flex. Um, now, obviously, he can do that because he wrote the song. It's his song. He owns the copyright. He owns the lyrics, so on. But let's say Beyonce says get information and I make a T-shirt that says get information. Am I wrong? Am I OK? Can I do that? Uh, that one is a little bit more difficult because that's. Get information. Mm -hmm. You could say a lot of people use that mm -hmm. particular line from a lyric. If you're publishing a part of a lyric, you're supposed to clear that. There's been lots of issues with people using that on mugs and things like that. And that's a right that you have under your copyright. If it's a if it's a small line like that, that could be considered, you know, a generic line and it hasn't been trademarked, which is a completely different part, um, okay. then you may be able to get away with it. So it just kind of depends on A, if Beyonce wants to go after you for that. Mm -hmm. B, if the court agrees with her, um, and C, usually that's like a trademark issue because that's like a slogan, um, especially something like get information, like three lines, that's really mm -hmm. hard to discern and say like, oh, you took my lyrics. Now, if you took like a whole verse and you put it right. on a shirt or on a coffee mug, that's a clear case of copyright violation and that you can go after. Got you. Just get information itself. That's a little bit harder. Okay. Um, yeah. So get information. Okay. That's vague. Let's say I'm going to make a tote bag that says I've got hot sauce in my bag. Swag. That's can't get away yeah. with that one. It depends. Every <laughs> lawyer is always going to tell you like there's a gray area. There's <laughs> never an absolute in law, which is what's great and what's also bad about it. Right. Um, I would err on the side of. I've seen the bag a lot. She okay. hasn't gone after anyone for it yet. So you can just give it a shot. Um, if something like that happens, more likely than not, they're going to ask you to do like just basically to take it down. You're going to get a cease and desist letter before anything else happens. Okay. If you get a cease and desist letter, don't ignore it. Because if you right. get a cease and desist letter and you ignore it, then you made that artist mad and then they're coming after you in court. And whether you're wrong or right, it's going to be expensive to be mm. right. You'll be yeah. broke before you're right. So just take it down. If you if you get the CND, yeah, litigation's not fun. Oh, that's why I go. That's why I do transactional work. Like I stopped litigating a long time ago, and I lost like ten years. I look ten years younger now. Like I'm just happier. <laughs> <Got> you. <laughs> not as bad as before. Cool, cool. Yeah. So I don't know how I didn't ask this question before, but can you, I guess, as as briefly as you can, explain the difference between a copyright? a trademark, and a patent, because I've heard you use all three of those today. Okay. Um, actually, I'm glad you asked because I've been working on this. Okay. A patent is for an invention or a process. Okay. So it, it's something that, you know, protects um, the design of something, right? Okay. Um, a trademark is not actually for you in the sense. It helps protect the consumer and let them know that they're getting a particular service or a particular product. For instance, Coca-Cola has a trademark, so that way you know when you buy a Coca-Cola can, you're actually getting a Coca-Cola product. Okay. That's what it's for. And then for a copyright, it is to um, give you um, a sole right to um, share and to provide a work of art to the world. So okay. as a thank you, for giving us your book, your music, your art. We're allowing you to have a monopoly on your art so that way you get paid for it. And then the general population um, can thank you for adding to the culture by providing this work of art. Okay, cool. And is that so, simple enough? 
that was yeah. that was simple enough. So um, if I am, all right, if I need to go patent something, am I sending that to the Copyright Office? Where does that go? That goes to the USPTO, which is the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Okay. But um, I would also let you know, uh, as an attorney, everyone thinks that attorneys can do everything. We mm. can't. That's why we have a lot of attorneys that do EGES, but um, even with a patent, there's a different bar. So mm. there's a completely different exam for a patent attorney. Wow. So you need to find a patent attorney to help you with that because it's a very long process. It's very technical. And that's someone who's usually involved in math or sciences who's going to help you with your patent. Interesting. Okay. So we register our sound or our composition with the U.S. Copyright Office. And your sound recording. The sound recording goes there too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and your music video. Music video. Okay. People forget about the music video. You should be registering that too. I forgot people make videos. They don't come on TV anymore. No, they're on YouTube. There are so many YouTube videos out there and you're collecting now. So shout out to the people on YouTube making really good videos. That's true. They're making themselves some pretty good money. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, that because people are like getting billboard charts off of just YouTube videos. People click right? on YouTube and also uh, especially international, if you want to go ahead and pitch internationally, mm -hmm. if you already have a huge numbers on YouTube, you have a better chance of pitching your music for sync in like Europe or Africa, if they see that you have strong numbers on YouTube. Okay. Now, while we're talking international, if I am an American, I created my work in America and I registered with the U.S. Copyright Office, if I had to pitch my music internationally, do I have to register it internationally too? No, I mean, most, um, there's reciprocity with most countries so reciprocity means like you know i'll honor your law if you honor mine when it comes to copyright okay um trademark is not so much i don't know if you know about this but there's a lot of trademark trolls that happen so like they'll have the trademark here in the united states and then in china or some other country because you have to register in each different country mm. they'll actually have the name of your company there knowing that they have no intentions of using like your name for like their company they just want to basically have you buy it from them Right. So yeah, that's another thing you should be careful of also. And trademark is huge. You don't see it now, but it's an investment in your name. Mm -hmm. And trademarks can actually end up being a lot of money. Like, um, for instance, Supreme, their trademark is worth millions now. Mm -hmm. And we, the we part of WeWork, uh, he sold it to his own company for millions as well. And he only had to spend, I believe, maybe 400 to 75 whenever he got at the time for his trademark. So it's a good investment, especially if you know that your business is going to blow up and you're going to be big. And gotcha. I think everybody will get to that point if they really work hard. So interesting. Um fun fact, P. Diddy is Diddy. Is it Diddy? I think he's Diddy everywhere except like one country where he has to still be P. Diddy because of trademark trademark mm -hmm. issues. Okay. All right. Crazy. And I yeah. think Michael Jordan is still trying to get the trademark to his name in China, like still. Yeah, because there's um, the World Intellectual Property mm -hmm. WIPO office. That's, that's what it's known as. Um, they have a way that you can go ahead and apply. And if you apply internationally, then you just have to pay the fees. Um, but it can be expensive because you're talking about like you're paying 275 for a trademark and that's per category. Mm -hmm. So I'm, actually, this is important too. I, mean, I know I'm going over time. It's, it's all good um but 275 and then let's say for instance you want to do it for um your performance like for the actual act of being um a performer a singer that's gonna be entertainment services right that's mm -hmm. a different class as compared to apparel so then that's two classes so then you're paying 275 twice right and then you have to let's say you want to do it in canada doesn't have reciprocity with wipo but say you want to do it in North Korea, South Korea, and, and in um, the European Union, then you've got to pay their additional fees as well. But if you do it through that one international application, it's going to cost you a lot, but you only have to do it once. So if you can afford it, try to do it all in one shot. And that doesn't cover every country either. So then you have to do a separate application, depending on the country you're going to, if it's not included in WIPO. Now, you said that each category, there's a fee associated with it? Mm -hmm. that's insane well not really because think of it this way if i had 
Apple computers, right? And I register the trademark for Apple. I'm going to register it also for like a t-shirt company. Mm -hmm. So I can't use it because, you know, I paid for the computer category. So it's to make sure that if you're going to be using that name, it's only for that specific category. So other people have a chance to enter the commercial space. It's gotcha. Fair. Okay. That makes sense. Um, right. For whatever reason, the U.S., uh, PTO trademark searches down right now. I can't submit a query, but I've done this in the past, just typing in random companies that I know of just to see how they're registered. You're but on you'll test? see, huh? You're on test trademark electronic search system. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Yep. Test. And so submit query. Oh, now it's up. All right. So I'm going to just click on one. And just look. Diamonds, jewelry, nuggets. Da, 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 da. Okay. Headphones. So that's cool. So I'm looking at Rock Nation trademark. Well, they have a lot. They do. They have a lot, a lot. Like a lot. Like I guess this is all. Well, this is all related to apparel. But I mean, they've got it listed. They have agency they have it for a bunch of things yeah yeah like i know beyonce said who run the world but i think it was girls but i think also maybe rock nation too because they have a lot of trademark applications it, there's different. a lot mm -hmm. and so wow well i guess that's good though because like you said if somebody wants to use the name rock nation um fun fact looking at this uh search there is a company that was using the name Rock Nation, um, and it was an acronym. The Rock was representing our Christ through the nations, right? So okay. let's say, you know, you're a church organization. You want to keep using the name Rock Nation. Maybe you're, I don't know. I don't know what category church is, right? Religious services. But you can do that, and Jay-Z can still do his thing over there, and everybody's happy. If the USPTO says it's okay. You have a trademark examiner, and if they say like it could cause, so there's this thing called the likelihood of confusion. So mm. even if you're in different categories, if somebody in the general public is going to associate your rock nation with Jay Z's rock nation, then they may deny your application. Gotcha. So I always say try, but just mm. know that you know nothing's guaranteed. And the closer and the bigger a company is, the harder it is to actually get it through because they have enough legal power to fight back in case right. it's an issue. Okay. Always try, but just know what you're getting into. Got you. So we have covered a lot. We've talked about what got you into law, what got you into entertainment. We've talked about um, some not mistakes that artists tend to make. Uh, right. We've talked about different deal points, things that you would like to see artists get more of um, and that you'll be working to get your artists we talked about a little bit about copyrights and trademarks. We talked about a lot. Yeah. Um, is there any, I guess, final advice or parting words that you would have for the audience? Well, attorneys never give advice to non-clients. So I, I'm always <laughs> like, it's legal education and information. Uh -huh. So I would, imparting wise, there's a lot of information out there. <laughs> um, and I would tell you, I know it's it's a plug, but Ari Herstand's a really, 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 really good source. Mm -hmm. You're a really good source. I mean, I'm not saying this because I'm just on your podcast. I actually followed you before mm -hmm. I got this invite um, because your YouTube page is very good and it's chock full of great information. Um, Thank you. Song Trust, yes. ASCAP, BMI, you're already part of it. They have a lot of good educational resources. And um, don't be afraid to speak to an entertainment attorney um, to help you. And the last thing I would tell you is join NARA if you can. That's the National Association of Recording Industry Professionals. Okay. It's 125, I think, for like the lowest tier. Mm -hmm. But they actually have a whole group of people who are in the record industry. It's a great way to get started. And also they have pitch sessions. So they have actual music supervisors who listen to your music. And you know for sure whether they're going to be putting them in their computers or not and saving them in their files. Okay. So learn like make sure that you're in the places where you can monetize your music and the music industry even if you're not able to speak with anyone right now is all about knowing people 
Um, so the more you can put yourself in groups of people who can advocate for you, the better off you're going to do. And it's unfortunate sometimes because there's a lot of people with a lot of good music, but you have to really get to know people in order to be able to pursue a career in entertainment. Got you. Okay. So uh, next five years, what are the goals for your law firm? Uh, actually, the latte lawyer, as it is, is um, transitioning. I'm okay. shutting it down um, at this moment. Um, I'm moving at the latte legal PLC, which is going to be a smaller firm, which is um, I'll do consultations, but I'm going to have a very limited number of people that I work with okay. um, just because it's like dating. Like you have to do a relationship. Your entertainment attorney is going to be different than I think every other attorney that you have because you end up speaking with them a lot. I have clients that call me at midnight sometimes, you know, mm, so yeah. I, it's a very like personal relationship. Um, and I started a pitching company with some of the clients that I already work with, including okay. the ones who um, are a lot of producers because okay. producers don't get as much as I think they should. Mm. Um, they're the bedrock of a song. They're the reason most people listen to a song and right. they're highly underpaid, which mm. I don't understand. So we're trying to figure out how to sort of um, put them in a position where they can monetize more. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be five years, like the firm, just a small number of people, um, more educational classes about like just how to establish and get your sheet together, right? To get everything, you know, done. Okay. And um, just more monetizing for artists. My goal is to have everybody understand how to make a decent side income from their music or their art um, or their films, because it's not fair for you to have to, you know, work to live when you should just be living and doing what you love if you right. can. Absolutely. Okay. So for anyone who's interested in keeping in touch with you and following, um, things you've got going on, how can they do that? Okay. Um, I right now have the latte lawyer up, um, but I'm switching it, um, to Oh, Hey Latte, which okay. is like a little bit more conversational like when i started so they can follow me on the latte lawyer for now um and then i'll make the announcement about the switch in about a month from now oh, yeah. okay cool so i will make a note and i will switch the links in the description of this uh podcast episode and in the video so that whenever she switches i'll keep that hyperlink so that you can reach her well I'll keep it up like the okay. latte lawyer will still be up. It just like will be like a ghost page, like, you know, what once was. So everything will still be there. But then okay. I'll let you know that, you know, you can click onto the new page if you'd like. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, Samara. Um, I think we should reiterate just one more time that anything that we talked about on this video, right? It's not advice. So it is not my uh, disclaimer. This is not legal advice. This is legal information and education, which I'm very happy to share. I love talking about law. Um, my boyfriend asked me to stop talking about it so much. Um, there's also podcasts on it. Like, I don't know if you know that the Supreme Court has a podcast called Oye, O-Y-E-Z. Yeah, I listen to that quite frequently. I, I really do love it a lot. I'm very nerdy that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like the Supreme Court. They're like all like 80 years old. Like... I, but like, have you heard the oral arguments though? Like legitimately, there was one about fuck. F-U-C-T, have you heard about this brand? They've been around since the 90s? No. Oh, okay. Very quickly. So okay. this guy, he's had this brand, it's a lifestyle brand since like, I think 1995 or 1996. Mm -hmm. um, he's been trying to get a trademark forever, but you can't trademark scandalous material. Obviously his name um, sounds like a curse word, right? But it's right. spelled F-U-C-T. So he finally won, and I listened to that particular podcast from his case, um, that he got the trademark for his name, fucked, F-U-C-T. So mm. now I'm looking forward to doing more trademarks for more scandalous names. So there are people that try to do it before they can mm. get it because their names were too like close to like, you know, bad words, but yeah. now they can. So oh, there's yeah. a, there's a similar situation in the music industry. Um, a guy named Simon Tam who wrote, can't remember the name of the book he wrote. I think it's Hack the Music Business. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a lead singer in a band called the slants um they are an asian american band um and obviously being slants is like a reference to um the shape of their eyes yeah the trademark or, uh, or 
basically they they weren't able to trademark their name because yeah. it was you know it was scandalous Offensive? and right they yeah. took it all the way to the supreme court and won so they yeah. could use the name the slants by the time they won the trademark they were done being a band but interesting story yeah that is actually i'm gonna look that up now thank you for that <laughs> no problem yeah. so um all right well Thank you so much again for your time. Um, Thanks for having me. This was great. I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. No problem.